Hi everyone, I'm Philip. Um, I'm from Vienna, city of fatty foods, classical architecture, and beautiful women. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you're not that lucky. Um, but I'm happy to be here. Um, so what do I do? I work at Elastic, I'm in the infrastructure team. So what we do is we provide Jenkins for our colleagues to develop stuff, we provide Ansible and Puppet scripts, we provide Docker images, uh, AWS instances and all of that stuff. And actually I kind of pipe, this is a Unix pipe, uh, pipe this uh, infrastructure work into the developer advocacy. So I'm doing lots of talks and conferences and meetups. And so that's why I'm here. And when I'm at some point in Vienna, at the moment I'm mostly someplace else, um, I also organize meetups. So for example, I have one bigger group that is called ViennaDB. We have a monthly meetup where we meet and talk about databases, relational, non-relational, anything in that area. So we have stuff like MySQL, Postgres, indexing, Cassandra, MongoDB, all those things. And I also run a papers group. So Papers We Love originally started in New York. And then San Francisco said, we also love papers. And they started a group, Papers We Love Too. And then it kind of spread all over the world. And now it, they are all called chapters. So they all share kind of the same logo and visuals on meetup.com. Uh, and what you do is normally you meet once a month, everybody reads a paper, and then you discuss it like what did you understand, what you didn't understand, like things you found interesting, and you just keep talking about papers. Back at university probably you didn't like it. Uh, once you can actually pick the papers yourself and just find interesting stuff, it gets more interesting and yeah, I'm running that on a monthly basis and I think we're meeting again in two weeks and we're talking about Kafka this time, so should be fun. So this is what I do in my free time. So let's talk about databases. Um, let's talk, start back at the very beginning kind of a databases in the 70s. So 1970, uh, Cott wrote his famous paper um, a relational model of data for large shared data banks, which kind of started databases as we know them today. Because when I look at you, most of you look pretty young, just like me. So we are, yeah, okay, not, not everybody. Nicola is very old. Disregard him. When he was young and starting in programming, databases looked very different. And this is kind of the point. Uh, so for the really old timers, uh, databases kind of developed. And for the younger ones like us, uh, it's, we just accept databases the way they are today, but we don't really think about it like how this, did all of this develop and where did we come from. And so before COD, there were different approaches to databases and different database vendors had just had very specific implementations of their databases and you actually needed to know like how is this implemented in this specific database to make use of that query your data and store it efficiently. And Kot said like, nah, this is not a good idea and we should find something else. Uh, so what he found was kind of the, the basic mathematical model uh, and these are the two main terms uh, of his paper. So he found a relational model and normal form. So this is kind of the math behind all of it. And that led to data independence. So he, he defined the mathematical model. And all databases that would use that model would act kind of similarly. And you don't need to know all the internals of a database because most of you as developers, you don't really care too much about the internals of your databases. And this is kind of the idea that Cod started back then. So what he did is, it's probably pretty small, but I'll just explain it to you. Probably everybody knows the stuff down here. Select X name from people X, where X died at age is null. This is very intuitive. And you just assume this is the, the most normal form to do stuff. Uh, but what Cod actually did is just the thing, the ugly thing here above. Uh, probably you're glad that you don't need to program like that, but what is defined here, you have a free variable t with an attribute name, and there exists a tuple with the attributes name and died at age, and there, in the tuple there is an x uh, in the sum of people uh, for which the died at age attribute is empty, and the attributes t and x, the names match, so this is kind of the data you get. So what Cod defined is like this mathematical 
model behind all of it. And then it took many more years of refinement to actually get to the SQL statement we have down here. So this is kind of how the relational databases got started back in the 70s. And the next paper then was also from IBM, and that was SQL, a structured English query language. Um, I know it's just SQL nowadays, uh, but in the beginning they started and called it a structured English query language SQL, but then there was some trademark dispute because somebody had registered SQL as a trademark. The product doesn't exist, and I think very few people actually know what it was. You can look it up on Wikipedia, uh, but still that was the reason why at some later point uh, SQL in the full form was uh, just shortened down to SQL and I think the, the acronym for structured query language was just added kind of later on because in the beginning it was a structured English query language and then just some letters were removed for trademark issues. And there's another very nice paper from the IBM guys uh, where they meet some 10 or 15 years after creating SQL or SQL and the, where they kind of discuss all the things that have happened around it and it's I think like 70 pages and it's kind of the history of how the databases actually developed the way we know them today and all of these little discussions they had that for example that the null keyword is super intuitive for us now but back then there were huge discussions should it be called null or empty or what do we actually call these things how do we model them and how do we structure all our query languages so this was a huge discussion and it took lots of work and refinement and one of the other interesting things is like all the IBM guys I mean they earned decent money, but they were just engineers. Uh, and they, they wrote all these things and it worked quite well for them. And at some point when they started writing their database, some guy called them and asked about the internals of that database they were building. And they told him pretty much all the details they had, uh, just not their error codes because they said that those are IBM specific. Uh, because they said, we just told him everything because Back at IBM, nobody get, got anything done anyway. So you could just tell anybody whatever you were doing because nobody could, got anything done. Uh, but the guy who they told everything was Larry Ellison. And he was the only one who actually got really rich by doing databases. And all the IBM guys who really kind of kicked it off and started it, um, they don't, didn't really get that rich. Um, <laughs> So kind of the idea of all of this is that you have a declarative syntax, so you just define what do I want. I, I assume everybody knows SQL. Uh, you don't really care how do I iterate over my results or how do I actually get the results I want. I just define I want these things and my conditions just need to match and then the database or specifically the query optimizer actually gets the stuff for you and you don't need to care about these lower level details. It's just all taken care of for you. And one other thing you can still see in SQL kind of is that it, in the beginning it was built for user interaction. Nowadays it sounds kind of strange because we have much nicer interfaces but back in the 70s, right Nicola, back in the 70s, um, uh, you were not used to nice interfaces. Um, you had your secretary could now, with SQL, finally uh, do actual reports. So you had these aggregates, so you could group stuff together, do sums, counts, all these things. Uh, you could now, now do with just some idea of how stuff works, uh, but what you wouldn't want to take care of is stuff like concurrency, integrity, and all these things. So this is one of the reasons why these are present in, in relational databases now. So this is kind of the history how it all developed. And then relational databases became popular and everybody had whatever previous product they were doing and they just uh, put the label relational database on it. It's kind of, even in the 70s and 80s you had buzzwords already. So everybody tried to use that. And then Cod did something very smart. He wrote uh, another paper uh, called Cod's 12 rules where he actually defined you need to do these things to actually be a relational database and this helped tremendously that all the relational databases today even though they are somewhat different still follow very much the same approaches and rules so even though you have minor syntactical differences and some variations in features uh, it's still if you know relational databases one of them is very easy to get the idea how all the others work. And this was partly or mainly because Quad defined these 12 rules. And 
Like any good person in IT, COTS started labeling at zero and he had 12 rules, so actually COTS 12 rules are 13 rules. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And buzzwords were all the rage and people started to writing their own databases even though they had no idea, just like uh, Dilbert's boss. Uh, and then if you ask the critical questions, uh, you get stupid answers like, I think Moav has the most RAM. So if you come from that background, you probably shouldn't write databases. But back in the days, everybody wanted to write a database uh, and yeah, try to get going. Uh, and then from this wide variety of databases, everybody in the 70s, 80s uh, wrote databases. Um, we went kind of to a dark age of databases. And the dark age looked something like this. So you have kind of the few very big vendors and all the others either went out of business or were bought up or destroyed in some other form and you were kind of stuck with these and this was kind of the dark age of databases here. Yeah, Oracle sitting on top and then DB2 and yeah, some of the rest. And Uncle Bob, pretty popular in the Java universe, um, he wrote one very interesting blog post where he compares that to the beer manufacturing in the US uh, when he said, yeah, they could brew proper beer in the US, but then during the 20s they had the prohibition, so the knowledge how to brew beer was kind of lost. And he said, that is also what happened in the database world, like people kind of forgot how to actually build databases, so in the 90s it was just like, yeah, you have the existing products, you have some minor improvements around them, but you're kind of stuck in this dark age. There's no major competition, uh, nothing really new coming in, and it's just like, yeah, nothing exciting. Much like American beer. And so then things developed, and you can think of this like, on top of this, this is your application, the dog is your application, and this is the relational database. So from the idea, your database is super slow and inflexible, whereas your application could go much, much faster without the database. So this is one of the trends uh, in the 2000s, why people started saying, yeah, this dark age of databases, this is probably not working out so well and we need something else. Uh, and then there's another paper, uh, Cap Consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And this is kind of the problem. Why are our relational databases slow? Or why do they not really scale? Uh, and the idea is that you have this cap theorem, you have these three attributes, and you can have at most two of them. Even though you want to have all three, you can at most have two of them. And if you build a bad system, you will uh, either have zero or one. So this is also possible if you screw up. So what are these? So consistency is that you have at one point in time, you have a single view on all your data. So you distribute your data over multiple servers and at one point in time, you have the same data on all your servers. So if you query something, you will get the same results wherever or whichever server you query, you will get the same result. The second thing is availability. Every request you send, you expect a response also kind of what you want. And the third thing is partition tolerance. So in a distributed system, bad stuff in a network or on your nodes can happen. And it's very hard to distinguish like, is the network broken? Is the node broken? Is the node just slow? You don't really know what is happening, so you cannot really rely on that stuff is working all the time. So you need to be able to take this these so-called partition tolerance into account. And if you want to build a, a distributed system, Partition tolerance is kind of given, so you cannot just work around that. And if you're in a relational world, you're kind of very much focused on consistency and availability. So your data is always the same, and it's always, when you send requests to the service, it will respond. But you cannot distribute it easily over multiple nodes. There is stuff like Oracle cluster, but that doesn't really work that well and doesn't scale up so much. Um, it's just hugely expensive. Um, so the new approach then is to say, okay, we need to distribute our data, but due to the cap theorem, uh, we need to sacrifice either consistency or availability. And you can only pick one of these attributes then. And the proof is they are actually not very mathematical, it's just uh, very constructive. So think of it, you have three nodes and you have them somewhere in your network, you have your three database nodes and they all want to have the same content on that node. And then some 
switch dies and you have on one side you have two nodes, they can see each other and then you have one node on the other side and that one node cannot see the other and the two nodes cannot also see the other. And then you have network a network partition, you need to decide do I want to be consistent or do I want to be available. Um, if you're consistent and you have a broken network, you cannot write because the one either you write to the one side then the data wouldn't be on the other side or you're not available because you just stop responding to uh, requests uh, when, as long as your network is broken. So this is the whole idea. When your network breaks you need to make this decision. Either I'm consistent or I'm available. And just to make it a little more uh, confusing, uh, consistency in ACID, the transactional attributes of relational databases with atomic uh, consistent, uh, consistency, isolation and durability, that consistency uh, is a different consistency than this consistency. Uh, the consistency in the CAP theorem is about seeing the same data at one point in time, whereas consistency in ACID is about you have constraints and these constraints are not violated. So you go from one consistent state to another consistent state and you don't have any violations in that. These uh, constraints would be stuff like you have not null constraints, uh, reference key, specific data types. So you can only move from one consistent state to the next one. Um, but that is not the same as consistency here. So for example, a very simple thing would be you have a counter so you can only count up. So if you can only count up, you cannot reach, an, uh, in the ACID sense, an inconsistent state because you have a number and you can only increase the number, uh, but nothing else can kind of go wrong. Whereas if you distribute that over two or more nodes, uh, these counters uh, might not be the same over all the nodes. So these two consistency attributes are not really exactly the same. And if you have children or if you want to explain it, the concept of the CAP theorem to your father, uh, you can simply use uh, Robinson Crusoe. So Robinson Crusoe, he's from England, he's sitting on this lone, lonely island, uh, so he's partitioned from the rest of the world and then somebody comes by and asks him a current question. So for example, a ship comes by and asks him who is currently the king of England since he's English and then he needs to decide am I available or am I consistent? <laughs> because if he's available he might get, give an outdated answer or he just doesn't say anything then he's not available. <laughs> so this is kind of the Robinson Crusoe explanation of the CAP theorem. And every now and then he might get the message in a bottle then he is eventually consistent. So with some time delay uh, he will actually know what is going on in the world and then he give, can give a more or less exact answer, more or less. And then there are always these people who say, yes, but now my network is super stable and I just don't have network partitions. Um, yeah, probably not true. Um, there is this guy, uh, Kyle Kingsbury, Efe. he's uh, torturing or destroying database uh, on a professional level by now. And he wrote one very good blog post where he actually put together from various sources all the stuff that can go wrong in networks. So he has examples from Amazon, Microsoft, Google, whatever, and they describe like every day 10 switches die and I don't know 50 wrecks die or go out of power, all these things that can go wrong. So network partitions are a real thing. You might not experience them on a daily basis but eventually they will happen. And if you haven't thought about the trade-off being either consistent or available, you will probably screw up both attributes. Okay, and the next thing is schema flexibility. Um, if you were using MySQL for a long time you know if you do any changes in the structure of your tables um, that will lock your table for the entire time when that operation is running. So as long as your tables are pretty small it might go very quickly and it's not a problem. But if you have few tens or probably hundred gigabytes of data in one table and you do an alter statement and you simply want to add one column that might lock that table for one hour, two hours, three hours, whatever, and during that time you can neither read nor write any data. Which is fine for some use cases, but not acceptable for others. Depending on the system, this is more or less painful, but this is generally a problem. That schema flexibility is not one of the great strengths of relational databases. So this was, besides the speed, the second big trend why people kind of had this feeling we're in a dark age of databases and we need something new. So the 
things you can actually kind of have or do is first, which is not very useful for our databases or anything you want to do is you can't just have completely unstructured data. You just have bytes on a disk. This would be kind of level zero, which is kind of pointless. The, the next level of structure in your data would be a key value store, just like Redis or many other examples, uh, where you can simply store values under a specific key. The big change to relational databases is relational databases are super flexible. As long as you have stored stuff in your table, you can query everything. If you don't have uh, defined an index on some column, the query might be slow, but you can still query all of that data. This is not the case anymore with uh, key value stores. You can only search over the keys. You know you have some values somewhere in your values, but there's just no way to get it. Um, this works fine as long as your data is kind of in the same format and you can just use it in a specific fashion that you can always know the key and just query by key. But if your application changes, uh, this might be a problem. So this is a very powerful model. It is super quick to query stuff, but of course it has its trade-offs. This is level one. Level two then is like richer data structures. For example, you have graph databases, like you have nodes and edges between them. And one of their big strengths is you want to go from A to B. You have two nodes in your system and you want to find the shortest path between these two nodes, which is super bad in relational databases. So if you would just sort that, like think about friendships in whatever social network you have and you, you view another person and then you want to know, okay, are we connected or which is the closest connection we have? Is it like one person between us or like three persons? Uh, if you would want to query that in a relational database, this is very slow. Because what you would need to do is either you start on your side or on the other side, but you need to start on one side and then you get all your friends. And then you start getting all the French for friends for each of your friends. And if the targeted person is not in that huge set, you would then get all the friends for all the friends. And this was, will just explode. And searching like that is just not feasible. Graph databases solve that. Uh, they are very good at querying stuff going from one node to the other and finding stuff like the shortest path. You can even weight the edges. So if you, for example, if it's more like uh, geographical stuff and you just know, okay, you put as the weight the kilometers between cities and you want to find the shortest path going through five cities, uh, a graph database can easily solve that for you. The next thing are document stores. Everybody loves JSON nowadays, uh, so you want to store JSON. Um, normally you just store JSON, you query by JSON and you get JSON back. So JSON all the way, uh, or turtles all the way or whatever. Um, so you'd simply have your JSON documents, you can store them. Uh, this fits object orientation quite nicely, as we'll see in a bit. And the final model is column oriented, which looks very much like the relational world with, looks a bit like tabular, uh, but you still have columns. And what you often also have is you have a third dimension. So if you have a regular table, it's very two dimensional. So, dimensional. so you have your rows and you have your columns. Uh, but what columnar stores often have is they have time-stamped values. So within that two-dimensional values, you can have, depending on when you insert new updates, you will have multiple values for one row and column combination. So this is kind of more a three-dimensional data store, which can, for some use cases, be very useful. For example, uh, Google used that for quite some time to store its search results which totally makes sense because every time they crawl your website and you have an update, they want to store the latest version and then you just add one with the latest timestamp. But you might want to go back and compare it to an older version and stuff like that. Then there are the relational databases with a rigorous schema. So you have all the values you store or all the uh, row and column combinations need to be there. Yes, you can add null values, but this is not really the idea of a relational database. Yes, you can use some, uh, but if you have 80% null values in the table, so if you have very sparse data, also a relational database is not very good for you. But what relational databases are good at is you have stuff like you have very powerful queries. SQL has had a long time to evolve and it is actually a very powerful language by now. And you have powerful stuff like joins which you normally don't have with the other data stores. You might have some 
construct to work around that, but it's not supported in any similar fashion to relational databases. Okay, so with all these trends, you have the performance aspect and you have the, that you might want different schemas. You have the no SQL movement, uh, which is basically called not only SQL. So it's not called no SQL, but not only SQL. But some people say yeah, the name actually comes from this. Uh, so somebody um, needs to write the CV. And the recruiter asks, do you have an exper any expertise in SQL? And the person says, no. And then the recruiter says, doesn't matter. We'll just write expert in NoSQL in your CV, <laughs> which might sound very familiar for some of your jobs. I don't know. And this is where the NoSQL boom kind of started, um, which is, of course, crap. Um, actually, um, NoSQL, the term, uh, there was a product, I think, in the late 90s or something, or the early 2000s. Uh, that just didn't have an SQL interface, but was actually storing relational data inside. Uh, it was written by an Italian guy, but the project is long dead. That was the first time NoSQL was used. And then in the middle of the 2000s, um, people started experimenting. So they came out of this dark age, just like the US kind of emerged from the dark age of brewing, because they have now lots of microbreweries and they might be able to do proper beer again. Uh, so people started to do the same for databases, that they started experimenting and they had specific use cases and start to, to implement solutions for that. And then some of these different implementations wanted to get together and do a conference. And they were looking for a Twitter hashtag. Yeah, Twitter is obviously forming stuff. Uh, and somebody suggested the term NoSQL. Um, even though, in hindsight, it might have been better to call them no rel for no relationships, because this is kind of what uh, you normally lose from the relational databases. Uh, but well, it's stuck, it's short, uh, it doesn't mean really anything. And whereas relational databases are very much focused, or you have a very specific idea what they will do, NoSQL is a super broad term. It can Whatever fancy stuff you do, uh, you probably try to put uh, the term NoSQL on it. Even if it's fitting or not fitting, you don't care. It's just fancy. And then, uh, yeah, I love Dilbert Comics. Uh, this one is one of my favorites. Uh, so in the book of Wikipedia, it says there is this thing called Big Data. And it will help you to make lots of money. And you can put it in the cloud. And yeah, as long as you uh, pray to Big Data, it will pay you back. Uh, this is what the, the boss is doing. So for big data, because it's also a super common buzzword, uh, which I don't like, uh, there are normally two definitions of that. The first one is very broad. It includes kind of everything where you have big data, uh, including the NoSQL you might put there. Um, as long as you can run it on your laptop, it's not big. Um, so everything going beyond your laptop might qualify or might not qualify. It's a very broad term. The other term you might use is everything that is offline and you do in a kind of a batchwise processing. Uh, so offline data or data warehouses with Hadoop and Spark or anything you call a data lake. Some people only call this big data. We could have a lengthy discussions which is no more appropriate. Um, I'm kindly or I'm generally leaning to the side that Big data is a buzzword, it doesn't mean much. You can put in anything you want. In, at least in German, we call it a suitcase word because it's like a suitcase, you can put lots of stuff into it. <laughs> Not sure if this really translates to English. Uh, yeah, but don't overuse big data because it doesn't mean anything. Okay, so which databases are actually popular? Um, there is this thing called dbengines.com and they have a monthly ranking and yeah, Never trust statistics, you haven't faked yourself, so we could also have a lengthy discussion about their metrics. Uh, but yeah, these are pretty common and widely accepted. Uh, these are from May, we might have the June numbers already, I'm not entirely sure, I haven't checked. Uh, but they're, normally that doesn't change too much from a month to month basis. So Oracle is still on top. But MySQL is actually catching up quite nicely. Then you have Microsoft SQL Server and then you have the first non-relational database or NoSQL database, Mongo, which is popular. And then you see here, yeah, Postgres, DB2, old timers, Cassandra. I have no idea why Access is still so popular, but okay. Uh, and then you have Redis. 
And down here, Elasticsearch. So what we'll do is we'll kind of look at one relational database. I have just picked Postgres because it's open source and very popular at the moment. And the other most uh, prominent or widely used uh, NoSQL databases, just to take a look at the specifics. So we'll take a quick look at MongoDB, Cassandra, Redis, and Elasticsearch to jump into a little more practical stuff. So. MongoDB. Um, I'm just picking MongoDB because it's so super popular, uh, but it's kind of not the only one. I'm, most of what I'm saying applies broadly to anything storing JSON. So you could use CouchDB, Couchbase, Elasticsearch, whatever floats your boat uh, into that. Uh, it's just document stores. So JSON is popular. We simply saw store JSON. And this fits quite nicely, especially about object relational uh, or object orientation. So there's this nice quote from Ted Neward, ORM is the Vietnam of computer science. It is nearly or pretty, I think pretty exactly 10 years old and I know stuff has improved a lot. Uh, but it's still a very interesting blog post uh, because it kind of describes I think six or eight points of things people where people start using an ORM and kind of fail. And then he describes like where you can fail or what the paths are. Like some are, um, you don't care about the database anymore, you simply persist your objects and you don't store them in a proper relational database anymore because it's just not working out. The other one is uh, you throw out object orientation. You simply make everything procedural because it's easier to work. And here's like all the things that can go wrong and this stuff kind of applies still, um, but we'll see why in a second. So who's using JPA or Hibernate or something like that and has written something like that? Sign, yeah, who, who's written some stuff like that? Um, do you think this is okay? <laughs> yeah, this, this is like, you're probably in denial if you think it is. Um, so let's see why this is the problem. So yeah, let's assume you have a very simple example. We have an abstract base class uh, employee, which has just one attribute name, and then we have managers and workers. And the managers can approve funds, and the workers have experience. Obviously, managers don't have any meaningful experience. <laughs> they can just approve funds and have no other qualifications. Um, so. This simple example, how would we structure that in the relational world? You basically have three approaches. And the first one is you just use one big union table with many null values, which in this simple example kind of works, but the more specific implementations you have and the more attributes you have in these, uh, the more null values you will have. And at some point, you will not really have a relational database, but more Swiss cheese with lots of holes in it. And this is not really the idea of the relational database. So yeah, you can make it work like that, but it's not really following the model. You can see this so-called impedance mismatch between object orientation and relational world, the relational world. These two just don't match up together entirely. So we're looking for another approach. Concrete instances without common queries. So what you could do is you cut could just, from our simple example, take uh, workers and managers and make two tables for those and just put all their attributes in them. You would have some code duplication, uh, which might be fine or might not be fine. Uh, and this works up until when you actually say, okay, give me the names of all my employees, both managers and workers. Yes, you can write a union clause. Uh, but again, you can feel like from the object-oriented point of view, this is super simple. Uh, but in the relational database, then it's kind of, you have two distinct things and you need to join them together. And it's just like the concepts are not really fitting that well. So you might say, yeah, I want something different. Um, so the third option would be you use uh, a base table. So you have the abstract base class, you make a table for that for the employees. And then you make two more tables for the specific implementations. So no code duplication, uh, you have a lot of tables. Um, it, it's working quite nicely. The only thing is you will need a join every single time you want to have a specific implementation, which again, it works, but it is not as nice as it could be or it doesn't really feel so natural. Okay. So what you could do is uh, I'm just using, uh, this is <coughs> Morphia, this is the ODM, 
since you don't have relations, they call it an object document mapper. Uh, Morphia is written by the, the company or maintained by the company behind MongoDB. So this is kind of their thing. So they have their own ODM, but you could use Spring Data, which would probably do pretty much the same thing um, to store this stuff. So what I've added is only on the abstract base class, I have annotated that as I want to store that in the collection, which is a table in the relational world. It's just called the collection MongoDB. I want to store that there and I'm adding an ID Never mind, it's just using an ID. Um, and my specific implementations are just the same. And what, how this would end up in MongoDB or in any other document store then would be, look something like this. Um, we have the attributes, name and improved funds, and name and years of experience. Uh, and then we can store the class name so we actually know where that thing is. If you refactor your code base, um, you would need to change it as well. Or you would, uh, instead of st storing the class name, you could just uh, use an enum you define yourself or some flag or whatever, um, and you have the idea. Uh, uh, the ID. Does anybody have an idea why you're using this up ugly object ID, which is pretty long and everything? This is what would be the ID. Uh, so a serial auto incrementing whatever it is called in your database. Uh, B and in the relational world, it's super easy to say to your colleague, hey, check out uh, record 4711. And here, you will, it will take some time to tell your colleague, okay, check out 524D9s, whatever. So, any idea why we have this big ugly thing? Yes, exactly. Um, if you want to have nice octal incrementing IDs, you need a single instance to take care of these IDs which is not good for distributed systems. So this is one of the trade-offs you need to make. But otherwise, I think that with JSON, you can store stuff much more naturally than you can in a relational database for object-oriented programming languages. Also, what I kind of find now infuriating whenever I need to work with a relational database, if I have a single simple list or array or whatever your specific data structure is, um, Putting that into a relational database is always a pain. You have foreign keys and you need to put the attributes somewhere else and then you reference them. Uh, whereas in JSON you simply make an array and you put all the stuff in. So it's kind of fitting much more nicely. Okay, so MongoDB is normally working great. Who is actually using MongoDB? Okay, a few. Do you like it? Good? Very developer friendly. Sorry? Developer friendly. Yes, this is a very good topic. I, I also think like developer friendly, yes. Uh, the, the developers start something, um, they really like it, and then they sh throw it over to the ops guys, and the ops guys are like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, uh, as long as you're just needing replication, it's all well working nicely. Setting up replication, we can do that in five minutes. But as soon as you need to go into sharding, so you want to split up your data, uh, it's becoming much more painful. And it's again pretty small, uh, but you don't want, need to read the entirety. Uh, so if you just have replication, you would just have this box, for example. So you would have one server which stores your data, and then you have two nodes where you duplicate or replicate your data to. And if one of those nodes dies, uh, the other two can take over and still serve your traffic. So this is replication. As long as you have only so many, so much data or so many requests that they can live on a single server and you can do all of that on a single server, this is what you want to use and everything is fine. As soon as you need to shard or split up your data, it's getting more painful. By the way, do you know why it's called sharding? I think it was in Ultima Online or some other game uh, that at the end there was the, the bad wizard who split up the world which was a crystal and he split the crystal into different shards and then each of these shards was a different server where you could play the game. So this was their easy solution just you had, this was the story, you split up the world so you would need to log into a different server so it was very easy for them to split up data over multiple servers and this is where the term sharding actually comes from. So as soon as you need this sharding, stuff becomes in MongoDB much more complicated or painful. Assume you need three nodes to store your data or to handle all your requests. What you then need is, you will have three nodes, these on top of here, who do the actual work 
and then for each one of them you want to replicate the data. Um, you could use an arbiter which is kind of small and doesn't hold all the data but you would still need like two full servers to hold your data. Only one of them can do writes. Uh, with a slight delay the other one could also do reads um, but still not solving all your problems. And then you would for a production system need three uh, config servers and on your application servers you would normally run a router which tells your application uh, which shard actually to target to get your data from. Um, so yeah, this is getting very complex. From single replication all nodes are the same. So, uh, so if you need to sp split up your data you suddenly go from three nodes to at least six plus three is nine and then you have the routers as well so this is getting pretty complicated and yeah the ops guys won't love you. So there are other solutions to do that. Uh, but we will give, before we go into the super sharding stuff, uh, let's take a look at Redis. Redis uh, is a key value store and a bit more. Uh, the name actually comes from remote uh, dictionary server. Who's using Redis? That's a surprising low number. Okay, because normally for, for me it's like Redis is the glue that's holding everything together or it's very common that you have Redis somewhere and it's doing all of these little things like caching and sessions or whatever you want to do. But you don't need to. Um, so the use case for Redis we're looking at is not key value because that's super boring. Uh, we want to know uh, who, which users have logged into my site. So you have users and they have signed up for your site and every time they log in and go to your server for every hour you just want to store like user a has logged in during today from 10 to 11 and accessed my site because the marketing team wants that information and they want to know okay how active are all the users and the active users will get a bonus and the inactive users will get more spam uh, to make them active again and then they will probably stop using uh, uh, your service and yeah whatever the marketing team does but you need to provide that information. Um, so you have two data structures you can actually use in uh, Redis. The first ones are bit sets and the other ones are hyperlog logs which are yeah, very fancy name. So bit sets are super simple. You just assign each user uh, a bit. So assume the users sign up so you have an order like one of user is the very first one to sign up for your site, one is the second one, the third one, etc. And this is also the bit the user gets. So for each hour you just initialize an array of bits and you set them all to zero and as soon as a user logs in during that specific hour uh, you just flip that bit and set it to one so you know that user has logged in. So for a million users you need a million uh, bits and that comes down to 123 kilobytes or something so that is totally manageable. For 24 hours, um, yeah, 3 megabytes, something like that, um, that's totally doable. Um, so you can simply keep that information and store it for your marketing team. The other option would be hyperlog log. Um, this is a probabilistic data structure so it is not exact uh, but it only uses for unique elements, it uses constant space. There is a paper behind it, you can read it if you're into papers. Um, so within 12 kilobytes you can store unique hits like user IDs, uh, IP addresses, all of these things and they have like 99% correctness uh, and still within 12 kilobytes you can just store as much data as you want which is very fancy and nice. So, to compare the two, uh, the nice thing about hyperlog log is that it's uh, only using constant size and it's super small to store stuff like that. The, the advantage of bit sets is first it's not probabilistic but it's an exact result and the second thing is with bit set you can actually aggregate the stuff. So if after one week you say okay I don't care about the specific hour the user has logged in, I'm only interested in has he logged in during the whole day, you have all the bits of that day that, so you'd simply or connect all the 24 bits of that user for that day and that result you can store for the day and you can just thin out your data as you go along. So this can be very handy. And generally I always have the impression Redis is super simple and it's kind of this omnipresent clue that you use for caching, sessions, whatever. Wh whenever you need to store some kind of stuff you just put it into Redis. Uh, 
But Redis, yeah, there is a clustering mode, but at the moment it's not so well supported. So normally you would just uh, shard that in your application. So you'd simply tell your application, okay, this either key range or this specific function just goes to this server and this other function goes to that server and you would uh, split it up on a functional level. So if you really need to split up your data, you can go to Cassandra. Cassandra's name is actually making fun of Oracle because you know that in Greek mythology you had the Oracle of Delphi uh, which was just sitting in the whatever fumes they were sitting in then they had their hallucinations and they actually didn't know what they were doing it they were just like talking shit and so in contrast Cassandra she was uh, the in in Troya and she was the one who could see the future but nobody believed her so the Oracle guys they have no idea uh, but the Cassandra guys can see the future even though nobody believes them at the moment. This is kind of the idea behind that. So the two attributes of Cassandra are scalability and high availability and what they're using is consistent hashing. Who's using Cassandra? Okay, very few. Who has heard of consistent hashing? Okay, good. I can do my slides and don't need to skip them. Um, so, uh, what we want to dive in, this is consistent hashing, we'll go into each of them because this is pretty small, uh, just to see how this is working and why it is so easy to split up your data and to be super highly available <coughs> and it is easy to shard the data. So first off, you have a key for your data and you hash that key. Why do you hash that key? Any ideas why you might hash the key and not use a key directly? Uh, no. Uh, what you normally want is to have an even distribution of your data. So you don't want to have any hotspots. So if you, for example, would use email addresses uh, for the key and probably, I'm not sure about the Ukraine, how, which letters are most common, uh, but at least in German, you would have lots of people whose letters start with an E, so that server would be super busy and the server where the, the name, the email address starts with a set there wouldn't be anything to do. So just to have this even distribution of your data, you simply throw it through a hash function and then your data, if you choose a good hash function, will be evenly distributed over all your, all the, the key space you have. So we simply say we have three servers. So we have a minimum key space, whatever that is, uh, and we evenly split up our key space into three parts. Uh, and Thanks to the hashing, uh, all the data should be pretty evenly split over all these servers. And what we do next is we rotate that key space clockwise to form a ring. So the next step is to form this ring. <coughs> this is just the rotation clockwise of the key space. So every time you hash something, it will, will fall onto a specific point on that ring. So for example, hash x lands here and then goes up until it finds a node and it finds the node A here. So the data will be stored on A and in case the node A fails to have a replica, the data also goes to the next node. So the data is also, this is the, the dashed line, will go to the server B. And then you have your hashing value Y and Y falls here on the ring. So the primary server is B and the replication is going to C. So this is super easy to split, uh, know, okay, the data is going to this server and this server, and we just store it there. Um, don't be confused by the ring. This is not like how your network topology needs to be. This is not a token ring network or anything like that. This is just the key space you're distributing, and then you can use whatever server and network infrastructure you have. What is nice about that ring, though, is that in case you want to add a node, so you're going from this to the top thing. Uh, you want to add a node D. So you're simply splitting up, for example, uh, the key range A. So you're taking half of the keys from A and put them primarily on D and the replicas stay on A. So you can simply add one node and only the direct neighbor is affected by that change. The same thing goes if one of your nodes is removed either explicitly or it just dies, you ser uh, your servers will figure out, okay, the node B is gone. So all the data that has lived primarily on the B node is now 
available on the C node. And the C node will then start after some time, it's okay, assuming, okay, the B node really has died and it's not just a network fluke. It will start to replicate its data also to A. So the data is again replicated. And you don't have any cha major change. It's just like, okay, this node is not available, but the related neighbors are taking over and you don't need to do any other major restructuring. And then the final thing is, if one of the nodes is being added or removed, you have in one region or neighborhood, you have lots of network traffic and changes. So you will normally just split it up into smaller chunks and multiple of these chunks will live on one server. So you just split your stuff into, I don't know, like if you have three servers, is this three? No, it's four each. So you just uh, split up each key space into four regions and each, and then you just uh, split it, spread it out. So your different servers will get different chunks. So if one of the servers dies, uh, for example, the green one, um, if the green one dies, this, 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 and this dies, uh, then these brown shards know, okay, I'm now the primary, I'm taking over, and I'm replicating my, di my data to this one. But this is not like one big key space, but many smaller chunks, and then you can also easily add new servers and just put some chunks uh, on one of the new servers. So this is how Cassandra works. Um, Cassandra is... Uh, eventually consistent, or I think their marketing team normally tries to say tunably consistent. Um, and yeah, some people says, like you see here, the father says to his daughter, like, come here for a moment, I, I need to tell you something. And he tells, uh, like, if you have important data, eventual consistency is too hard for your problem, which might be true or might not be true. But again, you can tune it if you want to, or if you are able to take a lot of latency overhead and duplicate that network overhead, uh, you can say, uh, you can define read and write quorum. So you have your data on multiple servers and every time, assume you have your, you have one primary copy of your data and you have two replicas of your data. So you have three copies of your data. And every time you write, you go to a quorum. So you, know, you write to at least two of these servers. And every time you read, you read from two of these servers. And whenever you read and the two values do not agree, you go to the third server and then you're actually sure, okay, which one was correct. So with this model, you always write to the majority and you always read from the majority. You will always get the most up-to-date data. But again, every query need, will need to touch at least two servers in our three-copy example, which is kind of an overhead. Okay, Postgres. Um, relational database. Uh, this is way too small for you to read, but I'll try to act it out again. So there is this guy. Um, He's standing and he says, yeah, well, this relational database is just so slow and it's not, not doing anything. I'm making a battle plan to move to a NoSQL solution now. And I've created my big uh, Gantt chart and we uh, will work for months and then migrate over to NoSQL and then everything will be fast again and we'll be happy developers. And then his colleague says, wait, let me have a look. And he says, and just, just as a thought, you didn't use the right index. So for many, Use cases, relational databases are still more than fast enough. It's just like the very basics uh, use an index. So you go from a full collection scan or table scan with the runtime O of N to uh, a, an index, which is a B tree or B plus tree, uh, where you have a runtime of O log N. So this is kind of not constant, but very low time. So even if you have lots and lots and lots of data, uh, from the full table scan, you might uh, compare a million records. If you use an index, you are only doing 10 compares. So this will give you a major boost. It is some additional overhead for writing, uh, but for reading, it will make your stuff much faster. So for many use cases, if you use relational databases correctly, they will still give you more than enough performance. And the other thing is, um, even though we call them relational databases today, um, actually what is most defining about them is the SQL standard. So I think they should more or less be called uh, SQL databases because SQL is not only limited to relational stuff nowadays, but it can do much more stuff. And it has years and years and years to evolve. So actually SQL is super powerful. You just don't know that if you're uh, A, either using MySQL because they don't have any features, or B, just uh, using Hibernator JPA, 
because again, that is not any using any advanced features. This is just kind of using the basic features from 10 or 15 years ago, and you're not really getting all out that SQL or your relational database could do. And the other thing is, the NoSQL world has actually kind of discovered that this SQL thing is super popular. Everybody knows it, and nobody knows my own stupid query language. So everybody tried to implement their own SQL query language, and they all found their own name. So you have the Cassandra query language, CQL, Google query language, GQL. Couchbase was a little more creative, they called it Nickel at least. Uh, but Rethink again was ReQL and it's, it's boring. So everybody kind of had their own solution and then people demanded SQL. And then they said, okay, yeah, we'll build some interface. And some are pretty proud of it. For example, Couchbase with Nickel, they will always tell you, yeah, we are SQL 92 compliant. And this is when the the relational database people are getting really sad because like saying you're uh, SQL 92 compliant is like saying you're Windows 3.1 compliant. Both came out in 92, uh, but nobody would advertise that you're Windows 3.1 compliant. But the NoSQL guys are pretty proud of it, which is kind of sad. But yeah, that's what it is. So what you get is Relational databases have been just around for much, much longer. So, of course, you get the maturity. And, of course, you get the tooling around it. So, you have lots of experience and many people can do it. So, this is a good thing. And also, like, NoSQL started on with very limited feature set normally. And then you had the big, fat relational databases. And they're kind of growing together a bit. Because with every new release of one of the NoSQL products, you normally have lots of features being added like SQL interface, even though they're called NoSQL databases. Um, and on the other hand, the relational databases also kind of look over the fence and see, okay, the NoSQL databases are cool, doing cool stuff. We want to store JSON now, for example, too. So Postgres can store JSON as well, JSON B, and it can be properly indexed and stored. And uh, MySQL has its own JSON implementation. And everybody tries to learn from the other side, so we're kind of converging together again. Let's see where this will lead. Uh, but still, kind of from the main difference is the NoSQL world is normally relatively easy to distribute, uh, whereas the relational world is still not. This is kind of because of the cap theorem. You cannot really break through that. And then we have something called uh, Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is not really a database. It's full text search. Um, Who is using Elasticsearch? OK, a few. Uh, so few. Well, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, so what the big difference is between a database and a full text search, uh, databases are very much black and white. So in a database you store data and you query your data and you get whatever exact matches you have, you get them back. Yes, you can do a like search, but if you use a like search with the percentage at the beginning, uh, you cannot use an index and it will be super slow. So be careful with that. Uh, whereas a full text search is very much more shades of gray. So you store some documents in your, your data store or full text search uh, index and you're not really interested in like the specific version of the word or like is it singular, is it plural, you're more concerned about like I'm searching for this concept much like you do in Google. Uh, you don't care about the specific form of the word, you just care about the general concept and, and thing you, you want to search. Um, so how does full text search do that? Um, you have this kind of pipeline, so you get in the document. First, you uh, remove any formatting or properties or anything. You just have the raw text. And then you have a parser. The parser will just take your big string, uh, paragraph, whatever, and then split it up into the, the words. Normally, you will do that on white spaces and dots, commas, and stuff like that. Um, after having the independent words, you remove stop words. Stop words are just common words which add very little meaning to your indexes normally. Um, so this is like articles, is, uh, or, or like, yeah, all these little words that are super common in all your, your documents and add little meaning. You throw them out uh, because you don't want to bloat your index with them and they don't add much value anyway. The next thing is uh, stemming. You throw away the word ending and reduce the words down to their base. So the word stem. For example, if you have beautiful and beauty, 
those would both stem down to beauty with an I at the end. Always depending on the language and the stemmer, but this would be an example. So you're stemming it down to the word stem. And if you're done searching for beauty or beautiful or whatever you're searching for, you would still hit both of them because they kind of mean the same concept. And optionally you could do synonym matching and then you're just storing that uh, full text index. So to give you a little more concrete example, you have different documents with words. Um, you remove lots of the stop words. This might be one of the list of stop words. This is also very uh, implementation specific. So for example, I know by heart that in MongoDB, if you, um, if you have the, from Star Wars the sentence, these are not the droids you're looking for, uh, what actually only remains is uh, look and droid. Everything else is considered a stop word uh, by MongoDB. This depends on your implementation. Uh, and also on whichever language you use, you will have a li different list of stop words. Um, we've just in the latest alpha version of Elasticsearch, we've replaced uh, the Ukrainian language stemming and stuff. So this should have changed recently. Um, so what you do is you store all the terms you have, stop words removed, stemmed, and then you simply say, okay, these words occur in these documents. And then you can very easily say, okay, give me all the documents that contain sky and then you will find documents two and three and then you say okay give me only the documents where we have both sky and blue and then you see okay sky appears in two and three and blue appears in one and three so you simply end connect those and then you just get three so this is the way how full text search then works and there's always a score this is the quality of your results well, when I said relational databases are very much black and white and full text search is very much these shades of gray, this is what is actually happening in the background. So you have the score and the two, it looks pretty complicated and it is, uh, it's well documented but just to give you the idea, the two most important things are term frequency and inverted document frequency. Term frequency means if a term occurs multiple times in a document, that document is probably more relevant to your search term. So you, if, you have, if you're you searching for Joe and one document contains Joe five times and another document contains Joe three times, the one with five times is probably more relevant. That is the term frequency. The inverted document frequency is if you're searching for multiple terms and one of these terms <coughs> is very common and the other one is not very common, the uncommon term adds more value to a document. So if you're searching for Joe, Joe, whatever last name, Joe Frank, Frankly. Joe Pesci. Joe, okay, well, whatever. So Joe might be very popular, so all the documents containing Joe add are not as relevant as his last name because the last name is probably very uncommon and the documents containing that add much more, more relevancy to the documents. And then you can do stuff like boosting. For example, you can say if a word appears in the title, uh, it's twice as important as if it was just appearing in a text body. So you can do all of these things. And in the end, you will get the numeric value of the score and this will tell you how good uh, is this document matching my search query and then you can get the best matches. Okay, and we're not only doing full text search, uh, we have kind of built the whole ecosystem around it. So if you are interested in logging, metrics and other stuff, come to me afterwards, I'm happy to show you stuff. Uh, we're pretty big in that now as well. So to conclude, um, this is kind of a bit the development of SQL and NoSQL and everything. Um, this is not by me, I've just copied it. This, uh, but it, back in the 70s, uh, no sequel was we have no sequel because Cod hadn't written his paper yet. Uh, in the 80s, it was no sequel, like, yes, this is the thing, you should know sequel and you should use it. Uh, then in the 2000s, it was no. SQL, this is crap, this is slow, this is inflexible, find something else. Everybody is finding something else. Then a few years later, it was, yeah, well, not so bad after all everybody knows SQL so yeah not only SQL um, but also then the no SQL part and then a few years later some people decided no 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 actually SQL was the right thing or this no SQL thing is crap so no SQL is what you actually want today um, and then there's always this question like but is it fast um, 
and I've seen, I think like one or one and a half years ago, um, Cassandra, MongoDB and Couchbase all made benchmarks, all with their two other competitors, and each one of them managed to find one scenario where they were at least twice as fast as both their competitors, at least. Not, mm, I, I think they found stuff where they were 10 times as fast, but each one of them managed to do that within the span of one month or so. And that is why benchmarks are mostly crap. Our stance on it is pretty much like, the only thing we can guarantee is that our benchmarks will be different to your benchmarks. So um, this is how I approach benchmarking. <laughs> Given similar conditions, and you're benchmarking two systems, uh, you might find results that are not actually that accurate. So uh, Professor Sapinski is testing if the squid or the house cat is more intelligent, and obviously the squid won by far, <laughs> and the cat even lost its life. <laughs> so whatever you approach benchmarking, be careful. And then, this is also already a few years old, so you can tell uh, FlockDB uh, was a graph database from Twitter, which I'm not sure if they're still working on that. Uh, so you can actually decide. Are you Google? Yes, then use HBase. Are you Facebook? Also HBase. No, and then you can walk through it. So uh, take 20 seconds, uh, and then I want a show of hands who is ending at which database. Okay, so who ended up at HBase? Who is working for Google or Facebook? <laughs> Nobody, okay. Um, who, uh, is, who ended up at FlockDB? Good, because it's probably dead. Um, who ended up at Neo4j? Poor neo 4 one, one, okay. Um, who ended up at Ryak? Okay, a few. Uh, this one is still around. It had a rough time, uh, but yeah, it's still trying. Uh, couch, it used to be CouchDB, probably now CouchBase. Who ended up at CouchBase? No? Any, anybody in MongoDB? All the others relational? Ah, this is very sad. <laughs> yeah, it's, there, there's no Elasticsearch there, but probably that would have won otherwise. Um, okay, so. That was it. Um, I have lots of stickers, so grab as many stickers as you want. Um, yeah, and any questions?